The Carbon Collection, light, strong and very cool. So is Tim carbon neutral or is there a diamond in the mix? Blinded by ignorance, how the Isle of Wight will soon be Jurassic Park thanks to natural England. Ben's hokey cokey clay lesson. He's smoking targets with his legs in the air just like he don't care. Yeah, good. You've got the balance of a pig. <laughs> Excellent. And as well as being sponsored by Game Ball, Ben is also sponsored by Pillar Sunglasses. And we have an exclusive offer from Pillar. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. This is a Canyon full carbon road bike, 7,000 pounds. Blaza carbon success, 7,000 pounds. Very similar weights. How cool is that? <laughs> Somebody described carbon fibre as the next generation clean material. So what's it all about? I've got over £50,000 worth of rifles here. Aren't they gorgeous? There's something about carbon fibre which really, really makes them special. It's not for everybody's taste. It may be not for the hardline hunter, but they're absolutely gorgeous. But what is it about carbon? It's on the bikes, it's on my car, it's on my tennis racket, it's on my hockey stick, it's on my shooting sticks, it's everywhere. But what can it do for the rifle? Is it just about the weight? I wonder. To gauge some public opinion about carbon rifles, I put a post on my Facebook page and I was quite surprised. I had over a hundred comments from quite a variety of people. And one of the things which came up about four times was that does having a lighter stock alter the balance of the rifle? So in that theory, if you lose the weight from here, and if you've got a moderate like we do in the UK, does it become more tippy? I think the word was, I think somebody mentioned to me, which I thought, yes, that's a really, Good. I, think I, I agree with that point. Um, and then some chap from South Africa wrote in, saying, hang on guys, you Brits, you use bipods, you use high seats, and you use sticks. So who the hell cares about tipping point of your rifle, about the balance of the rifle? At the end of the day, you plonk them on your sticks, and you just, Take a shot. In South Africa, we have our 375s and our big old boys after Buffalo, and we freehand. And the balance is very, very important. So actually, guys, you don't need to worry about that. I've got 12 and a half stone on this, on this Browning stock, okay? I'm um, not the thing you normally do, but uh, I'm just trying to make the point is what you gain with carbon is you can have the same rigidity but at a lot less weight, yeah? So it may not be any, uh, more, any more rigid than a, uh, a, say, a synthetic compound, but is actually lighter. And that's the biggest benefit of using carbon. One of the many questions I was asked about carbon is, is how durable it is. And uh, I think there is definitely a question mark, all depending on, the, on the, the design and also how the stock's made. But I do really think that if you compare, let's say, a a carbon stock to a synthetic or a, or a laminate stock, 
I think that actually the carbon stock will probably scratch maybe a bit more. That's just my own personal opinion. I've only had these for two weeks. I've shot them all. I've shot deer with them. I've dragged them through bushes. Sorry, Blaza. Didn't, mm. I have done that actually. Oh, anyway, and uh, yeah, no problem at all. But I, I do think that actually sometimes the carbon stock would be easier to scratch perhaps if you were to drop a carbon stock. I think they vary quite a bit. This is quite durable. This is quite thick stock. Um, whereas some of the other carbon stocks are a lot thinner. So I think if you were to invest in a carbon stock, you'll probably be a lot more careful what you do with it. So that's probably the thing. So are they more durable? I question they are. Barrels, carbon barrels. One of the things people talk about is the heat dissipation. They apparently are able to kind of dissipate the heat and maybe better than a steel barrel. Not too sure about that, but it's one of the things they talk about, despite carbon fibre being insulated, but there's, a, there's apparently something which happens in the process, the way the barrel's made. Anyway, the only way to try this out is actually to burn some ammunition. And a very unscientific way, perhaps, all I'm going to do is put several shots through this rifle. I've taken the moderator off because the moderator for this rifle will not put up with kind of 15 or 20 shots. Get nice and hot, and then I'll go to the, uh, and fill that, and then I'll go to the Browning X-Bolt, and we'll do the same thing, but and the Browning x has got a fluted barrel, so it's, yeah, it's interesting. Anyway, let's have a go. We'll get them nice and hot, which is quite fun. Burn some ammunition, and see if we can actually just feel the differences between the two barrels. Okay, um, you boffins will probably say this is absolute rubbish, but uh, anyway, we're just trying to just, just an experiment really. Um, the the um, Browning, which has got the fluted barrel, is a very, very light barrel. It's a very, very kind of, it's a, it's a sporting barrel. Um, that's actually quite warm after five shots. Um, the fluting is obviously helping the, the, the heat to be dissipated from the barrel. And uh, this, uh, the Christensen's Arms carbon barrel, actually is very, very cool. Yes, I know this is a thicker barrel, so therefore it will take a lot more time for the heat to kind of go out. So actually, We've actually proved nothing at all, <laughs> but we're just trying to make the point that some manufacturers are saying that the carbon barrels dissipate heat but more and better than steel. I don't know, I'm not sure, but leave you that to figure that one out. This is the new Browning X-Bolt Pro Carbon. It's the Pro because it's got a Cerakote coating all over the action and also the, uh, the bolt. Fluted bolt and uh, a lapped barrel. And the most important is actually got a carbon stock. So this stock is actually foam on the inside, but it's actually being wrapped with two or so layers of carbon fibre around the outside, which makes it actually very durable. It's a very, very pointy rifle. It feels actually lovely. And what that's achieved is actually, it's actually knocked about half a pound off the weight of the rifle. So it's a half a pound, which is quite, which is quite a bit. But the, the X-Pro, carbon is about £2,000. So this is the cheapest model we have here today. It just shows you what great value for money. But delightful stock. It's got nice little inlays here which are fairly grippable and also on the fore end. So overall, actually, that's value for money. Okay, from America, this is the Christensen Arms Ridgeline. This is a light hunting rifle. It's got a carbon composite stock. But the most exciting thing about this rifle is the barrel. It's got their own manufactured carbon barrel. So you can see from this, it's a quite a thick barrel, quite a thick profile. And the idea actually is this thick profile gives a lot more rigidity compared to a steel barrel, but it's a lot lighter. And that's the point about carbon barrels. You, you can actually get a lot thicker barrel and the rigidity, but for probably one or two pounds weight saving. So if you want a workhorse, this could well fit the bill. You can use it for stalking, you can use it down the rifle range. But if you want a carbon barrel stock combination, this could be the one for you. Now we're getting into the luxury market. <laughs> the Sauer 404 XTC, the, the C means carbon. Isn't that a thing of beauty? You can see the very fine carbon wrapping on the stock. Um, the thumb hole is absolutely gorgeous, and you've got the adjustable stock on this. So, this rifle is around about five and a half thousand pounds. A standard 404, about three and a half thousand. So, you're paying two thousand pounds extra for this carbon stock. But you are losing about 
three quarters of a pound in weight as well. So there are advantage to that. So you're paying extra 2,000 pounds. It looks simply gorgeous. It feels absolutely wonderful. And that's five and a half thousand pounds. And that will do everything you possibly want. All the way from Finland, this Seiko, the Sarko Carbon Light. So this is a Seiko Fin Light with a carbon stock. What I find very, very interesting about this is the price point. This is about £2,700 retail. You can get a bit cheaper in the shops, as we all know, but it is so, so light. They've shaved a pound off the fin light with this. So it is so, so pointable. It just feels absolutely gorgeous. And I think the way the, the carbon's been put together, I, I don't know how they lay these carbon things, but they've got obviously a shell, two shells clamped together and, and polished. But that is a really, really well put together rifle. One thing I like about this is actually the grippability. The actual surface is not slidey at all. It's actually grippable. So I imagine when it's wet, it's even better. I've had a few of my mates turn up to have a play with these rifles. And uh, all I can say is as soon as they pick this one up, they felt, oh, this feels nice. Yeah, yeah. But at 5.3 pounds, this is, it's so light, but they just loved the way it felt. They, did, they picked it up and went, wow, that is just, that's a proper stalker's rifle. That, I, I think it's just one hell of a rifle. As soon as I pick that up, I like this. And now for something completely different. This is what they call the hooligans rifle. No dis disrespect to Daling Company custom rifles. This is a beautiful bit of engineering, but compared to our stalking rifles, it is a bit of a hooligan's rifle. It's a Manners Tactical Stark. It's got a Defiance um, action. It's got a Proof Research Sundero barrel. It's 18 inches long. This is a 6.5 Creedmoor with an 18 inch barrel. And it's got obviously this very, very tactical stock. You can see the carbon fiber on it. It's very heavy. This is actually a practical rifle come range uh, rifle, so it's not really a stalking rifle, even though you probably could use it for stalking, but it's just different, it's interesting. I've shot this out to 700 meters, it shoots very, very well. And also, on a serious note, the practical rifle competitions, which are just starting in the UK, are proving so, so popular. And guys, this is the kind of thing you'll be using, so feast your eyes on this. This could be the future of the practical rifle industry. This whole rifle, scope, the moderator, the whole thing is about £8,000. If you would like a bit of quality bling, this is it. You see the way this, this, uh, this stock listens in the, in the sunshine here. It's actually a beautifully designed stock. I, I'm being very disrespectful to say it's blingy, but it's, it is in some ways. You know, this, this is the R8 Carbon Success. So it's a standard R8 with a very, very lovely looking carbon stock. And it's also got uh, the, the leather insert. So it's similar to the R8 Monza, but with a carbon stock. It is a lot lighter than the standard R8 Professional Success. It's about half a pound lighter. The Monza is about four and a half thousand pounds. Um, and this is seven and a half thousand pounds. So for every 100 grams of weight loss, it's going to cost a thousand pounds. Okay, some will say that's a waste of money, but they are absolutely bald gorgeous. If you're spending that much money on a rifle anyway, uh, why not? So that's the Blaza R8 Carbon Success. This is a Blaza K95, the diamond in the collection of carbon rifles. It is an absolute beauty. It is unique. Oh, I just love it so much. But anyway, it's got to go back. You don't see many of these in the UK. It's a single shot mountain rifle. It's just like a little shotgun. It's so, so light. This one's in 308. But what they've done is they're normally in wood or synthetic. They've put the carbon fore end and the carbon stock. You know, I've shot up in the, the Alps with one of these. Um, I think I shot a chamois actually with one. And just chucking that over my back, you know, or putting it into my rucksack. I mean, it comes apart. Look at this. It's just, just like a shotgun. There you go. Just put that into my rucksack. How cool is that? Oh, I just love it. Oh, I can't. Oh, I just want one. I just want one. I've obviously got very expensive taste, actually, but uh, <laughs> okay, I know you yes, are. yeah. 
So is there a place for carbon on the rifle? Most definitely there is. Perhaps there's more advances to be made with the design. It'll become more affordable. What's the next stage in stock or barrel production with carbon? It's, it's absolutely fascinating. So I think it's just the start of things to come, really. And as for my rifle test today, absolutely loved it. It's fascinating learning about carbon and what it can do. And as for my carbon footprints, ooh, I think I need to go back on that bike and burn a few calories. Thank you, Tim. And I must say the K95 is futuristic, but very nice. I do fancy one of those. Now, from sleek carbon to a diamond in the rough, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. General licences in England, the row over shooting corvids and pigeons, among others, dominates the news. The submissions are in. UK Environment Secretary Michael Gove has started his consultation on the general licences. Basque submitted a survey of nearly 30,000 members who voluntarily took part in just four days last week. Thanks to the 1,000 people who took part in our survey too, which we also submitted on Monday. If that 1,000 is a representative sample, it may interest you to know what the average field sports viewer is like. You were out once a week in the last 12 months on an average of 2,230 acres. You and your friends each took 1,150 pigeons and corvids off your ground. Your own personal tally was 633 wood pigeons, 159 corvids, including carrying crows, hooded crows, Indian house crows, rooks, jackdaws, jays and magpies, 90 feral pigeons, 11 collared doves, 7 Canada geese, 1 herring or lesser back-backed gull, 1 monk or ring-necked parakeet, and no Egyptian geese or sacred ibis. In the last week, Michael Gove updated and published the general licence for shooting wood pigeons to prevent damage to crops. And the Countryside March in London is gathering pace, with more groups backing it and volunteers handing out leaflets about it at country shows. For more, visit fchannel forward slash Countryside Rally 2019. Countryside campaigners have been keeping a record of Corvid attacks on livestock. Lisa Bowring, who is at BowringLiz243 on Instagram, sends in these pictures of a kid killed in Warwickshire, plus the story of six-year-old Savannah from Lancashire. She had her pet gosling Daisy attacked and killed by a crow, seen here flying off with the gosling's head. Even bird watchers are protesting against the general licences. A twitcher called Michael Brewer posted these pictures from RSPB Leighton Moss on the Yorkshire Birds and Birders group. He spotted the first of the Avocet chicks that had hatched at 8.30am. By lunchtime, all had been eaten by gulls. He writes, the amount of gulls and crows nowadays is at epic proportion. The little birds have no chance. The Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust puts out this clip of Roy Burrows, land manager on the Summerston estate in North Yorkshire, voicing his concerns about breeding lapwings. But this is how vulnerable they are. Yes. Even though the camouflage is fantastic, that is quite vulnerable. If, if you think of how far we've, we're coming and how delicate this species is, and with us not being able to control Corvid, like carrying crows, jackdaws play a major part, and if they're left exposed, unprotected jackdaws are just mop these up. Seeing how quickly it caved in on general licences, it's now open season for Natural England from Antis. Badger campaigner Tom Langton launched a High Court legal challenge, arguing that because, he claims, badger culls increase the fox population and so rare ground nesting birds, which are predated by foxes, are being put at risk. Natural England reacted by setting farmers the impossible task of proving the badger cull poses no risk to ground nesting birds. A new study shows that hedgehog numbers are falling because badgers eat them. Researchers believe that hedgehog numbers are falling because the booming badger population is eating them when food becomes scarce. The decline is also being explained by the fact that badgers, whose numbers have increased in recent years since farmers were banned from culling them in the 1990s, compete for the same food as hedgehogs. The findings come in a study which show a close geographical link between the decline of hedgehogs and the presence of badgers. This film posted on Facebook shows a badger caught in the headlights trying to kill a hedgehog. Fire crews have tackled another blaze at Hunt Kennels. 
animal rights extremists are thought to be targeting hound lorries, as this burnt out vehicle belonging to the Atherston Hunt in Leicestershire shows. The fire service says this is the second lorry fire at the same address within the past three months. Police are investigating. Essex County Council has voted down a motion to ban trail hunting on its land. A councillor called Lee Scordis, who introduced the motion, tried to whip up anti-trail hunting feeling online. In March, Nottinghamshire County Council banned trail hunting on its land. Ofcom is investigating the BBC after its ambush of the Devon and Somerset staghounds. The Countryside Alliance made an infringement of privacy complaint over an episode of the PM programme on BBC Radio 4, which included a feature from a BBC reporter who accompanied animal rights extremists as they followed the staghounds earlier this year. The feature, which went out in February, included a recording of the master of the DSSH, David Greenwood, who was recorded without prior notice and without his consent. Animal Aid is running anti-shooting adverts on London buses. The animal rights organisation is using the ads to ban cages for breeding game birds and encourages its supporters to contact Michael Gove about them. Field Sports Channel's contributor Jens Ulrich Hoag has appeared on ITV's This Morning to talk about hunting. He went up against former cricketer turned animal rights activist Kevin Peterson who is campaigning against rhino poachers but also inexplicably campaigning against trophy hunting. A new film makes the case for grey squirrel control. Turning the tide on the impacts of grey squirrels was shown at the recent Red Squirrel Southwest Conference. However, again inexplicably, Deaf for Secretary Michael Gove has extended licenses to rescue and release grey squirrels until October 2019. Two horrible films are doing the rounds on social media. For the first from South Africa shows a rhino calf trying to suckle milk from its mother, which has been killed by poachers. The second is from South America. It shows security camera footage of a jaguar taking a pet dog. And finally, trouble in Malaysia for five men who claim that they found a carcass of a clouded leopard. They posed with it and posted the pictures online. Then they buried the carcass. Smelling a rat, the National Park Service dug up the carcass and arrested the five men. They face fines of up to £50,000 and five years in prison. You are now to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stuck in the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now we promised to give away a luxury Field Sports Channel black beanie to one of the nearly 1,000 people who filled out our survey last week. And I've entered all your contact names into my special competition winner chooser app on my phone. Here you all are. I'm going to scroll just to show how many there were of you. And I'm going to press the choose button there. And the winner is, the winner is Paul Sharrock. Paul, I will give you a ring, find out your address and send you your black beanie. Now, if you think the general licenses were a bolt for, from the blue, imagine what it's like to be a farmer or a gamekeeper on the Isle of Wight, which is about to suffer from a Sea Eagles release programme that they unanimously voted against. Well, they might have been unanimous, but Natural England they say yes. We're on the lambing fields of the Isle of Wight and the ravens are stalking the ewes. This one is in labour and is struggling. She's up now. She's From walking. about 800 metres we watch the large corvids manoeuvring to attack and eat the lamb as it's being born. We can't help. The shepherd is attending to another ewe. At this point is where I find the aftermath of what the crows and the ravens have been eating whilst my back's been turned. We can see that she's got a lamb coming out and they're trying to peck at the lamb before it's even hit the ground. Heading across the valley, he fears it'll be too late. It is not a pleasant sight, but it is a familiar one on this farm. No, no tongue and no eyeballs. This is what we're faced with on a daily, daily occurrence. So we've watched this, studied the sheep from the other side of the valley with the long lens. You see she's trying to give birth, had a bit of a problem, so we had to come and give her a hand. And that lamb was eaten alive in the process. 
eyeballs and its tongue are gone too, and if it had survived, it wouldn't be able to feed. They've also, whilst the ewe's been laid on her side, they've also tried pecking at her back. It's either in the back or in the lower abdomen that they go for, because they know where the lambs are inside them, and they'll open them up. Quite literally do a caesarean whilst the ewe's still alive. It should have been twins. The second lamb has suffocated. This one's dead as well. So, yeah. Oh, that's a shame. We'll definitely take her back to the farm then and give her, give her two lambs as a replacement for that. Yeah, it's a shame. We've come to Cheverton Farm because it is on the front line. They're being bombarded by policies, regulations and conditions from those who just don't seem to understand how the countryside works. They are already feeling the financial costs of the general licence fiasco, but to add insult to injury, the Isle of Wight will soon be home to 60 sea eagles with one of the release sites right next door. So what reassurances have the farming community had from those in charge of the project, Natural England and the Roy Dennis Foundation? None at all. No, at no time have, we, have I been uh, contacted by anyone other than the NFU uh, to get my opinion on this and other, other sheep farmers or other stakeholders in it. The reason that I'm concerned about this project is I regard myself as a stakeholder. These uh, eagles be released next door to my property and will have an impact on my business and I think that qualifies me as a stakeholder of the 80 plus percent of of the local population that supported it and I'm not saying that my opinion or my vote is worth any more than theirs but I do not believe that all of those supporters are stakeholders. Their business or their lives will not be affected positively or negatively by this project. Some of them very possibly and I'd love to speak to more of them to see where their view, view comes from. The largest raptor in the country is being reintroduced here and the farmers have been kept in the dark. Andrew wants to make it clear that he's not against the project, but once bitten, twice shy. Buzzards and ravens were once rare. Now, as we've seen, they're thriving. My own personal view was that I wasn't against the project, but I wanted some conditions put in place that should it cause us a problem to our business, there is compensation there. Now we've been reassured on many times that that won't be required because it won't have a negative effect on our business. Back on the fields and Ross is working hard to cover the 730 acre farm, trying to keep his flock safe. He finds it demoralising, marking and tagging a newborn to come back a few hours later and find its eyes and tongue pecked out. This is the future of our Cheverton flock right here. And the problem we're having now at this stage, the ewe's done her bit, we've come along and done our bit, and then the crow la flies in, and as you can see, these lambs aren't that mobile at the moment, not until tomorrow or the next day, and they're just sitting ducks waiting for corvids to come and eat them, quite literally eat them alive. We don't have an issue with sea eagles. We have an issue with those deciding their destiny without talking to the people. It will harm the most and the groups that censor and deny the long-term consequences of this rewilding. Now, Natural England says, there is no evidence of this being a problem where the eagles live alongside lowland sheep in Europe. However, the youngsters being introduced to the Isle of Wight are being rehomed from the west coast of Scotland, where these images were taken, so they already have a taste for lamb. We published these shots two weeks ago. They've now been picked up by the national press. Some rewilders are suggesting it's hare. It is clearly a lamb. Ask a sheep farmer. Now that would be a first. My personal view, I'm a pro-conservationist, but I do kind of, I feel quite strongly about this, this particular project. Um, I don't personally have a problem with sea eagles. Um, I just have a problem with the release site being so close to um, two of the biggest sheep farms on the island. We've already got so many things against us. We already have 
fox and badger predation, um, seagulls, uh, the whole corvid family all visit us on a daily basis. Um, and, you know, I can understand losing dead lambs, a stillborn lamb, if that's a free feed, um, as carrion for something, then that, I don't have a problem with that. But when we're having live lambs taken, they're under 24 hours old that aren't able to fend for themselves. Um, it, you know, it, it's very disheartening. Um, it's sickening, really, when the effort that we all put in, um, not just us here, but farmers up and down the country, um, and all we're trying to do is feed our families and ultimately feed the country. Back in the yard, and some good news. The ewe who lost her twins is being introduced to some orphaned lambs. It looks like she will accept them as her own. The latest estimate is that the farm has lost 200 lambs so far to corvids. It means this farm will have seriously to consider other strategies, and that's before the biggest bird in Britain comes home to roost. Isle of Wight now twinned with Jurassic World. We spoke to NFU spokesman yesterday. Uh, he says none of the parties are prepared for the Sea Eagle release. He's asked for the project to be put back at least a year. And he says that the argument about Sea Eagles not having an impact on sheep from the Netherlands is not valid because farming practices in the Netherlands are completely different. For example, they lamb indoors in the Netherlands. What can you do? Take up clay shooting. Here's Ben. Okay, what you can see there is, is James completely steering, moving, driving, however you want to describe it, the gun, with his left hand. That's how most people, probably 90% of shooters, would move that gun. So what happens is, when we move the gun with our left hand, two things happen. I'm going to point an empty gun at you now. If I stand towards my kill point, being the camera here, heel, toe, through the through the kill point which we've discussed previously and then I move the gun with my left hand if I pull the gun it pulls upwards down to muscles if I push the gun it pushes down again due to tension in muscles as you can probably see with James James knows where a gym is so his muscles are actually accentuated he's quite a large a large guy so if he tries to turn he's got limited movement so without giving the game away on how we're going to move, I'm just going to run James through a couple of exercises I would use on a lesson to just show students how to move the gun differently. So what I want you to do first, James, is your normal setup. But what I want you to do is place the gun on the back of your hand. So you'll hold the gun like this, call Paul, and make your normal shot. And again. Oh. So we'll see on there. James has started to move now from the waist up. He can't push or pull because he's not connected to the gun to hold it. If he did make an exaggerated move, the gun would fall off. So what he's done now is start to engage his core into the shot. That's starting to turn from here. Now the next exercise I want to do is I want you to fully load the gun for me, get yourself ready, and as you call Paul, I want you up on one leg and shooting off one leg. Okay, I just go into one leg. Mount the gun first, mate, get yourself set. Oh. Yeah, good. You've got the balance of a pig. Paul. <laughs> Excellent. Now, they're your best two kills. <laughs> but they're your best two kills. Yeah. Now, what you would have seen there is we've actually lowered where he moves the gun from his waist all the way down to his ankles, and that's what we're going to be doing. But if I, what I've found in all of the lessons I give, if I say to you, right, don't move the gun with your hands, move from here, it goes completely wrong. The reason I use those two little drills is to just 
simply lower it. Did you feel the difference? Yeah, definitely. You know, we get, but again, as every action has a reaction, this is the same. So again, I'm going to be pointing an empty gun at the camera. If I use the movement that James moved first, I'm going to point my gun, or James's gun, not mine, I'm going to point straight into the lens and I'm going to move my left hand by one inch, okay? So I'm coming just next to David's earphone there. Can we see that, David? So what I'm going to do now is make the same turn, same amount of effort, except I'm going to move from the floor up. I'm going to turn my belly button by the same distance, by one inch. You can see how much further I've got. I'm almost 45 degrees away from David. So that allows me a lot more time on the bird. It also moves the gun quicker. So it does have its own, you do have to dial sometimes, recalibrate your lead for this method. So if I go to my kill point now, which the kill point is here, so my whole point would be halfway back, which is there's a white bag or flowers in a clump there. Watch how little my shoulders and my core have to move to cover all of that distance, okay? So there it is, there's my hole point. To get all the way to my kill point, that's how much I have to move my shoulders. It's absolutely nothing to cover all of that distance. If I do that with my hand, I have to pull and pull and pull. That's my hole point. So the movement I have to make, moving from my ankles upwards, that has just covered the full 30 yards of flight of that target. And that's moving all the way from here. So James, you've done the two drills. What I want you to do now is we're lining up heel through toe to the kill point. To start with, I want you to mount onto your kill point and wind back to your hole point. I would never want you to do this in a competition, but it's a great way of memorizing the move. So you're gonna feel the move through your ankles. And I find it easier if you almost try and grip the ground with your toes. Yeah. That's gonna engage muscles that most shooters wouldn't use. Then you're gonna wind back into your hold point. So we're starting to feel what that movement is. When we call pull, we're gonna unleash and go the other way. So as we can see here, James's heel, toe to his kill point. So we know his body's set up in the right place. If you mount to where you're gonna break it, James, then feeling it through here, turn back. You can see the whole jacket move and he's now facing this way. Pull. Turn. Beautiful. Hardly any effort. Pull. How's that feel? Smooth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if we can see this time on the camera, there's absolutely no movement, no movement here, but we must be moving because- Yeah, yeah, but the line- it's The line, yeah, our shoulders are parallel to the line, so we're not having to worry about being high and low. And also, like I say, if you feel, if we, get a, if we had to shoot that a little bit quicker, uh -huh. a little bit more burst yeah. of energy through the legs and the core, the gun will speed up, will speed up massively. Okay, just try two more of those for me. This time, I want you to see if you can do the move without mounting to the break point first and turning back. So, I just want you to feel it in your legs. Yeah, great turn now. Everything's facing the camera. Oh. Rotate through your legs. Beautiful move, beautiful move. Oh. <laughs> Superb. <laughs> You're not going to get much better than that. Oh. Oh. So once again, we've got an empty gun. I'm just going to show you the benefits on the line of actually rotating through our legs and core. If I rotate through my legs, I go to the center point and then I rotate through my core, you'll see I can hold a parallel line. I can stay perfectly on the bank without going up or down. If I then go back to making the shots that James made when we started, so I'm going to use my left hand to make the movement. Once again on the shot cam, you'll be able to see when I mount to the center point and I use my left hand and when I pull the gun, it's not holding a nice straight line. So again, rotating from my legs and core, allowing me to hold that clay's line. That's only going to be more consistent on our kills. Just to highlight the differences in the moves, we've got an empty safe gun. 
So James, if you can just go through the motions of what you did before. So I'm going to slow you down because I'm going to describe it to the viewers as we go. So from the hold point, go to fully mounted. We can see his predominantly his belly button and his midriff is facing out to the hold point. When he moves the gun, you're going to see nothing here move. The shoulders won't rotate. So on my count, just a very slow move to the left, James, with your hand as you were shooting. Three, yeah, good, go. No upper movement. The core's not moving. And as we can see, the material in the trousers are not moving either. There's just no, no mo mobilized movement through the body. It's all down to the hand. So now, if we go heel through toe, so James is now out to the break point. If you mount to the break point for me first, so I can just talk through it. So that's the break point, mount there for me. Now, if you watch James turn back to the hold point, using his toes to grip on the floor, we can see this leg's given, his knees facing you, the whole core's facing over here, not the break point. The shoulders have gone more sideways on. So if you mount now, James, and slowly start turning to your left, everything's moving. The legs are moving, the, now the vest is facing this way, his left shoulders come back to be square, so the whole body is acting almost, if you imagine a scaffolding pole driven straight through you, you've got a spine, a spine at which you're now rotating on. Just do that move once more for me. Try and move from here. So we mount the gun, there he is. Legs now facing here. Vest accentuated movement this way. And when you start to rotate, everything goes back as if it's being turned on a barrel. That's the movement you should be looking for. As I said previously, the only thing this can do is speed the gun up and you may find you're missing targets in front. That's not a problem. Recalibrate the lead. I'd rather see a smaller lead than a bigger lead all the time. I'm going to be more consistent when I see that. But hopefully that will help you out on the range. Now, just very, very quickly, there's something I feel like I, I should explain. If I've got two targets, so if I'm facing the centre of the shooting position here and I have to break one target here and one target here, Again, I think we've covered it before. We have to understand which is our weak side. My weak side as a right-handed shooter is my right side. So if I stand neutral position and I turn to my left, I can get behind me. If I turn to my right, I can only get to this position here. So if I had a, a, a report pair, I would stand this way to make sure I can get to my kill point on my weak side. But again, I'm still gripping the floor and I'm going to rotate through my legs, making sure I can get to both kill points. Don't just feel like you have to stand neutral or on the offside. Always defend your weak side. Should people be spending a lot of time in front of the mirror? Yeah, I mean, it's the greatest way to learn. You know, free, free learning is the best learning, as I said earlier on. So if I can stand here, because it's going to be a very different move for people. Everybody just moves with their upper body. What we've got to try and do is lower that centre of gravity gripping onto the floor to begin with and really start to feel what that move is. When I turn back to my right, I have no problem with my left knee giving a little bit. And if I go to the left, I have no problem with my right knee giving a bit. That's going to make me get into position and then the whole body turns. You'll see the whole jacket moving, not just staying forward and pushing and pulling and risk losing the line of the target. Thank you, Ben. Now you may have spotted that most of the top competition clay shots wear pillar eyewear. And here is Ben to explain why, after which we are offering you a pillar box set at an incredible 20% off. Clarity-wise, there's nothing to compare with them. That, that's, that's a given. They, they seriously enhance what I'm looking at, and you can't hit what you can't see. You know, that's predominantly the reason you want the best eyewear. Now, people sit there and they say they can be an expensive product to use, but again, I can't hit what I can't see. If you buy a pair, you could shoot with those glasses for 10 years. You know, they, they're so durable. That averages out to half a tank of diesel per year, those glasses for pure clarity of vision, knowing you've got the best on your face. They created a fantastic product. And like I say, all, for me, it comes down to clarity. I want to see the target as good as I can. And these enable me to do that. 
So here is the new limited edition pillar package with an instant rebate of almost £400. There are only 150 available in the world, priced at two and a half thousand US dollars. But with our exclusive instant rebate available to our viewers, that is just £1,535. There are two lens kit options available to you with either six progressive lenses or all seven new chroma shift lenses. For more information and to place your order, follow the link on the screen. Right, from eyewear world exclusives to the best hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. James Bedford from Game Dynasty is shooting rabbits with night vision from a quad, plus some daytime rabbit shooting too. He sends me this video of him in action with 17HMR and Night Sight Wolf. Greg from the Row Stalker channel is out nighttime wild boar stalking in Poland. It's the spring and he is careful to shoot boars, not sows, with Dependent Young. More action from Poland, Potrek 81 Hunting, which is one of the biggest hunting channels in Europe, posts some shots of this season's robot stalking. Good to see a gun company supporting hound sports. The Rabbit Hunter is a film by Winchester about American Charles Rodney's relationship with his dogs, his passion for field-to-table living and his connection to the land. Unusual dog work from Bosnia. Well, unusual for me. A pack of German short-haired pointers are being used to flush foxes and other small game to guns. There's a new channel from Germany's Jagd Total. Carsten will carry on doing hunting on Jagd Total and has now launched the Long Range Guys to cover target shooting. Turkey hunting is underway in the USA in this film from Team Radical, a lad called Connor takes his first Tom. And finally, viewer Tom Halverson likes Reindeer, a Sitka blacktail story about the Sitka blacktailed deer of southeast Alaska. A passionate biologist, Sophie Gilbert, shares her story of learning about these deer through her PhD research and how she finds help from a local hunter, Prince of Wales resident and hunter Jim Beechtal. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description if you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv well that is it for this week if you haven't done so already please go to our website fieldsportschannel.tv which has numerous advantages you can click to like us on facebook and on instagram you can follow us on twitter you can subscribe to us on youtube you can pop your email address into our constant contact box at the bottom of the front page you can find out about Field Sports News also on the front page and you can back us go to fieldsportschannel.tv slash shares to find out about that I'll see you next week. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye.